Welcome to Glendale First United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Chris Tate, and I'm so happy that you've decided to join us for worship today. It's our hope that every time we gather for worship, whether it's in person or online, that we all experience God, that we come to or grow in our faith in Jesus Christ, and that together as His followers, we can help to make His difference in the world. So it's my hope, it's my prayer, that that's what you experience during this time today. For those of you who have been watching these videos over the past number of weeks, you may know that we are asking you to complete a survey called the Readiness 360. It's so that we can hear back from you. And so as we seek to determine how we can best move into the future in a way that's meaningful for the people who are here and help to make Christ's difference in the world around us, uh, we want to know uh, where you are in the midst of that. So you can see the link below, and so I would encourage you to do that. Also, coming up on the 11th, a week from today, if you're watching this on the 4th, it is going to be our fall kickoff Sunday, where we're going to be beginning our fall programming and all those opportunities that we have for hands-on ministry, for discipleship, for learning, for all those sorts of things that we do in the fall that helps us sort of get back in the swing of things after the long summer to help us to be mindful of what it is to be growing as disciples of Christ. So if you'd like to know more information about that, you can follow the links below. You can also go to our website, glendalefirst.org, and find out more there as well. And so with that said, and as we begin to worship, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to this time, to this place. We set it apart so that we can grow, so that we can not only grow in who we are, but in who we are in relationship to you. Speak to us in this time. Help us to know not only who you are, but who you have created and called us to be, so that with your work, with your power through your Holy Spirit, that we might truly grow into those disciples that you need for us to be to help bring about your kingdom on earth. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes to us from the gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, and it says, Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended this dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is their own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So whether you have been with us for a number of weeks or you're just joining us for the first time today, uh, we are going through the gospel according to Luke, uh, one of the four gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and seeking in the midst of that to better understand who it is that Jesus is, uh, what he's like, what his values are, 
and what it is to live like him. Because my understanding, I believe our understanding is, is that what it means for us to be Christians is to be, to be like Christ, is to do the things that Jesus Christ did, uh, to live as he lived, to, to operate in the world as he would operate in the world today, and to seek to do that as much as we can. And also believing that we don't do that on our own, that we do that with the Holy Spirit working in us. But nevertheless, to make that happen, we have to have a sound understanding of, of who Jesus was, about what was important to him so that we can apply that knowledge, so that we can follow that guidance in such a way that it is, it is evidential, that it is present in our lives in such a way that it can be seen and witnessed by others. So if you have been with us for a number of weeks, you will know that as we've been going through the gospel according to Luke, we have been dealing with some very difficult scriptures. Times where Jesus seems extremely harsh, where he doesn't seem to make sense, where things that he said seem to be completely disconnected from other things. But as we've looked at them and as we've studied them in their context and using the other information that Jesus provides for us in this same gospel and the gospel according to Luke, we've become we've begun to understand that, that it is cohesive, that it does make sense if we look at it as a whole. And, and our expectation is that, that when we come to the church, when we come to the scripture, that we're not expected to check our brains at the door when we do that. And so we will be thoughtful in dealing with what is another very difficult scripture for us to understand today, and that being the parable of the dishonest manager. So as we've done in each of these difficult scriptures, the first thing for us to do is to look at them in context. And what that means is, is to look at them where they fit in this story. So just like when we would read any other book, which the Bible is not just any other book, but if we were to read another book, we wouldn't just pull a particular chapter out of it and look at it completely by itself and say, this is everything that needs to be said. No, that, that's not what we would do. We don't do that with the Bible, and especially we don't do it within books themselves. And so the Gospel of Luke being one of those. And so as this story of the dishonest manager is told, it's told in a specific time and in a specific place. Uh, last week we were in Luke 14. This week we've jumped ahead to Luke 15. 16, excuse me, we skipped Luke 15. Luke 15 is the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, which is often known as the prodigal son. The reason why we skipped Luke 15 is because I have talked about that, Pastor Stephanie has talked about that many times because it's a primary lens or way to help us understand what is happening. But in that story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, this story of the dishonest manager happens immediately following the story of the prodigal son. So it's not that there's some sort of significant scene change that happens and then all of a sudden, uh, let's say as, as the, you know, the, the scene unfolds or the curtains go up or whatever it is, or we come back from commercial, they're in somewhere else with different people doing different things. This is the same conversation. So in the scripture, if you look at it, as Jesus finishes the story of the prodigal son, where it's talking with the older brother and the father, that this one who is dead is now alive and we have to celebrate that. Immediately after he says that, he launches into this talking about the dishonest manager. So because of that, we know that these are inherently connected one another. So what the parable of the prodigal son is telling us, Jesus is also speaking a similar truth here. And so that helps us to get the first sort of clue in looking at this. The other is, is that when Luke in Luke, when Jesus begins the stories of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, again, that's a particular setting. Jesus has gathered with sinners and with tax collectors, which he often did, and the Pharisees were there, the, the religious elite at the time, the priests were there at the time, and, and they are mocking Jesus. They're mocking Jesus and say, how can you do this? How do you consider yourself to be a holy person to be a righteous person, righteous being doing the, the God-like thing at the right time, how can you be this person and be hanging out with these people? And so it's in response to that that Jesus gives what happens in Luke 15, again, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, and then launching into this about the dishonest manager and what we will have coming for us next week as well.
We need one more clue before we can really start dealing with our scripture for today. And I appreciate you sticking with me through this, but you'll see in a moment, it's really gonna pay off for us. Last week we were in Luke 14 and we were in the section titled, The Cost of Discipleship. It was in this that Jesus said that you have to hate your family, that you have to hate those people you're connected to, you have to sell your possessions, you have to do all of these things to be a disciple, to be a follower of His. And we looked at that and came to understand that what he's saying to us there is not literally that we have to hate our family, but instead what he's trying to help us to understand is what our first love is, what it is to have rightly ordered love. And what I mean by that is, what is it that's the most important thing in our life? What is it that when we have to make decisions and we have to choose between things, and, and you probably know, as you know, we all do, if you're an adult watching this, if you're a kid, God bless you for watching it, but for us adults watching this, we, we probably know as well as I do that most of the decision, at least the difficult decisions we have to make in our lives, are choosing not in good or bad, but choosing among good options or maybe even among bad options. And so in that we have to prioritize things. What Jesus was saying in Luke chapter 14 is that God is to be first, that God is to be the most important thing in our life, not instead of in everything else, but coming first. So that it's not that for me personally, I have to choose between being a Christian or being a spouse or choose between being a Christian or being a parent. But if I choose Christ, that that's first. And so being a follower of Christ informs or shapes what it looks like for me to be a spouse. That being a follower of Christ informs and shapes what it looks like for me to be a parent. So that I'm a Christ-like spouse, so that I'm a Christ-like parent, so that I'm a Christ-like supervisor or, you know, spender of resources or all of those sorts of things. That's what Jesus is trying to help us get. So let's take all of that as we go to the scripture today. So now that we've finally gotten there, we're in Luke 16. Jesus begins by saying, by telling the story about a rich man who had a manager. Now, now we can imagine what rich people are and what managers are, but in that day and age, and even at this time, Jesus has come from the north and is moving to the south. He's in this region in between as what we've talked about in Luke is the travel narrative. When Jesus is talking about a rich man, he's talking about someone who has a lot of wealth, who has a lot of property, and who, in talking about this manager piece, This is most likely a rich person who lives in the south and lives around Jerusalem. That's where the rich people lived in that day and age. That's where if you if you wanted to live in the right neighborhood or the right zip code or the right edition or however we might talk about it today, the people of power and influence and wealth, that's where they were. They were in the state or the region of Judea where Jerusalem was and they were concentrated there. And so most of the way that people would have their wealth um, would come from owning property. But the property that they would own, it wouldn't necessarily be sort of generational farms that they would have had in their family for years. Instead, what would happen oftentimes, particularly in the time of Jesus, is that there were taxes that were levied, just like we have today. And so what would happen is for people in the north, who would grow most of the wheat and most of the olives and and produce the livestock, for those people as they would grow their things, and also grapes for wine, that they would grow them and sell them. But they would also face extreme burdens of taxation on them. And this may be a little hard for you to imagine, but in that day and age, the rich were often exempted. They would not be paying their fair share. They would pay very little but it was on the backs of the poor that most of this tax revenue would come. And so what would happen if you were a small farmer or rancher that you would produce what you do, but then you would have to pay all these taxes and eventually it would get to the point where you wouldn't be able to pay. And so because of that, what would happen is the rich person who would not be welcomed in this region because of what would happen to them, because of how hated they were, because of their predatory practices, they would instead send their manager. That's who we're talking about here. The manager who would go and would speak on their behalf to these people. And so when the manager would go, they would say, well, you know, we can't pay. The farmers would come and say, we can't pay the taxes. We can't make things meet. And so the the manager would say, okay, we understand. And so what we'll do instead is that you can keep farming. You can keep raising livestock on this land, 
but it will become ours. Where it has been land that's been yours for generations through your family, we'll take the land and you can live on it as a tenant farmer. And so that way you can keep doing what you've done. You can keep producing, you can keep having these things. It's just the land will become ours. And that would happen for so many people. And then not surprisingly, over time, those taxes would continue to increase more and more so that these now tenant farmers, instead of landowning farmers, would find themselves in places where even they wouldn't be able to make ends meet. So in this particular situation, Jesus is talking about a manager who the rich man, his boss has come to him and said, you're not doing a good job. You're not doing a good enough job squeezing these people that I've put you over to get as much money out of them as possible. So I'm gonna fire you, you're gone. But before you do, go up there and settle the accounts. So when the manager hears this, he realizes how disposable he was. That even though he was closely connected to this rich person, that he was doing their bidding, that this rich person was more than willing to just cut him loose at a moment's notice if it wasn't in the rich person's best interest. I know we may have to imagine this. But anyway, the manager goes to the north and realizing this, he thinks, I've got to do something about that. I've got to think about my well-being. It says in the scripture that he's too weak to go out or not willing to go out and to dig ditches and he's too proud to beg, which there are songs there. But anyway, that as he goes out, he thinks about what am I going to do? How am I going to be able to live and just survive? And so in this moment and in this time, he begins to do something that we might consider to be uh, stealing or scandalous or all these sorts of things. And he begins to negotiate with these people who owe money to his master, to the rich man. And he cuts their bills in half. You owed all this olive oil, cut it in half. You owed all this wheat, reduce it. You owe all of these things, slash them so that you're only paying a fraction of what was owed so that the rich man still gets some. But now that I have, um, I have relational equity with you, that we have this relationship now, at least he thinks they do, because of doing these things for them and they will likely receive him and welcome him in because of what he's done. And really the fascinating thing is after this, that, that this manager, this dishonest manager, as sort of the, the section heading titles it, is praised for this, is celebrated for this. And I think it's that that really makes us think, what on earth is Jesus doing here? What on earth is it he's talking about? So if we stop, if we stop here and we go back to the beginning of this conversation that started at the beginning of Luke 15, where, G, where the Pharisees were mocking Jesus because he was hanging out with uh, tax collectors and sinners, what Jesus is trying to do is that he's speaking to them. It says he's talking to the disciples, but he's speaking to the, the Pharisees so that they hear what he's saying. I mean, he also wants the disciples and other people to hear this as well. But what he's speaking to with the Pharisees, as he so often does to these religious elite and religious insiders, is speaking to them and reminding them that they don't value people enough that people aren't important enough to them, and not just a period there, but people aren't important enough to them because they value money too much. Let me say that again. Jesus is telling them that people aren't important enough to them, and they aren't because they value money too much. What Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees is for them, they have money at the top of their list of priorities. It's not God, it's not other things. For them, it's money. And because of that, that has tainted everything else that they do, everything else that they say, all these ways in which they're operating. And Jesus is confronting them with that. Now, you may be asking yourself, money? This is really about money? That's what Jesus is talking about here? But let's go back to the text. Let's go to Jesus himself. This is Luke 16, verse 13, the last verse of our reading today. No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. And this is the important part, the last sentence. You cannot serve God and wealth. So if we take all of these clues, if we take all of this information, if we take all of this that we've gone through today, Here's what I believe it means. 
Jesus is trying to help us to understand, just as he was the Pharisees in that day, he is trying to help us to appreciate, is that we should not have relationships for the sake of making money, but money and all other things exist for the sake of relationship, it exists for the sake of people, it exists for the sake of using him in such a way that we would, if God was the most important thing in our life, if God, if God in Christ is our first love and everything else is impacted by that, then even how we use our money is determined by that. It's not keeping our, our money, our retirement, our investments, our homes, whatever it is that gives us that piece of financial security. It's not keeping that at the center of who we are because if we do, we see people, especially people who are in need, who are so often present in the church or present in the area around the church, we see them as threats. We see them as liabilities. We see them as expenses if money is first. But if God is first and our call to love God with all that we are and to do that by loving others as we love ourselves, then we see those people not as liabilities, but as people who are created in the image of God. And therefore the money and financial resources we have are to be used in such a way that it helps them as well. I know these are tough words to hear, especially in our capitalist and materialistic society today. But I think Jesus would speak them just to us as much now as he did to those people then. Jesus calls us to make him first in all our life and for everything else to fall into its proper place after that. And our money is no different from that. I've said this before, so if you've been with us, you know this, that of all the things that Jesus talks about in his life, in his ministry, that we have accounted for us in the four gospel accounts, the number one topic is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Number two is not prayer, is not discipleship, is not the Sabbath, is not any of these things. The number two thing he talks about is money and material wealth because he knows the power and hold that can have on us, how easy it is for that to become the most important thing in our life. We'll continue this next week as we go to the next part of this conversation as it closes with Jesus having another statement, another uh, proclamation about riches and what they can do. So I hope you will join us for that. But between now and then, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we remember the love that you have for each and every one of us, that it was so great that you were willing to live our lives, to live on this earth, to suffer and die and be resurrected for all of our sake. And that that's not a love that is ambivalent or distant or removed, but that it is a passionate love for each and every one of us. And because of that, you want us to receive that and to respond in kind not making our faith with you an afterthought or something that we might do every once in a while when we watch a video or every once in a while when we come to worship, but that you want that to be something that changes everything, that truly changes all of our lives. So help us to have the relationship with you to be first and foremost. Help us to be willing to do that and to know that we do that with your help and help us to trust in you, that you want that for us, not just because you need more followers or you want to burden us or keep us from having fun or any of those things, but you want us to live a fullness of life that we can experience nowhere else. And gracious God, as we pray these things, we also pray together saying, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we have been particularly reminded today is there's only one thing that can be our greatest priority. And we've been reminded as well that we often struggle with determining whether that priority is God or is something else. And so one of the ways that we can do that is by taking something that is dear to all of us, our material wealth, our money, 
and be engaged in actively giving it away to God as an act of worship and as a way of furthering God's work in the world. The way you can do that here at Glendale First is by giving online, and you can find the link to that in the information below. So with that said, let us pray. Gracious in God, we are reminded again and again in your word how much you love each and every one of us and that you seek to be that first love in our lives, that, that our relationship with you is first and that it changes everything else that comes afterwards. And so here and now, we thank you for this opportunity to give back to you a portion of those blessings we have received and as an act of worship and as a way of keeping you at the front and the forefront of who we are. So bless these gifts that are given this day, multiply them as only you can, and through their use, may they truly help to change your world. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray, amen. So don't forget uh, to fill out the Readiness 360 if you're part of the community here at all, because we'd love to hear back from you as we plan on how to best move forward. And then of course, don't forget that this coming Sunday, a week from today on the 11th is our fall kickoff Sunday, um, where we'll be launching the fall. And so we'd love to have you join us either back for this worship video or join us in person if you're in the area here in Glendale. But with that said, and as we go back to our lives and whatever waits for us there, May we remember what God and God in Christ calls us to do, and that is to have God first, to have our relationship with God first in all of our life, so that in everything else we do, that it is impacted, that it is changed, that it is shaped by that, and in doing so, we can truly help to make Christ's difference in the world. In the name of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, and the Redeemer. Amen.